Uh, hello, everybody. I'm back uh, again uh, to talk about uh, Chapter 3 and also talk about the uh, upcoming exam uh, this uh, week coming. Um, first of all, I, I've been a little bit late with all this this week because I've had a starting out uh, last weekend uh, having a bad cold and uh, sinus issues. I have allergy issues, but uh, one of the big problems is having to stay in the house so much and uh, being, uh, you know, exposed to the air conditioning and that uh, circulates the dust, as you well know. And uh, really has had a, today's been my best day so far and that's maybe the why I look a little peaky is because I'm still uh, very congested. congested uh, from it, so, uh, but hey, I mean, I'm certain, certain it's not COVID, it's just a, my, my, uh, unfortunately, my ongoing uh, allergies at this time of year and being in an air-conditioned house all the time. Uh, but that said, um, in chapter three, a couple of things. One thing is that I want you to, uh, you know, well, focus on, on your study guide and while that's not everything, think of that the guide is basically pointing you towards uh, uh, areas of, of the chapters that the exam will come from. So, for example, I might have more than one an one question on any of the uh, or any of those concepts you see there, or theories, or people, or so they're hints. Uh, it's a hint, hint list of what's going to be on the test to give you some advantage in studying up. And um, another thing about Chapter 3 on uh, methodology, I'm only testing you on the uh, sessions on, on the qualitative. Uh, so I'm not going to be testing on the quantitative uh, at this point. Uh, they'll, they'll certainly read that whole chapter. Uh, and, uh, but I'm going to be testing you. Most of the test questions you're going to see are dealing with the uh, qualitative side of uh, research. And uh, so, uh, so, to, so next week, then we have, we, we're going to start in tomorrow, actually. Uh, sometimes, if I'm still up for whatever reason, uh, after midnight, sometimes I'll let go ahead and open the, uh, exam uh, but I was usually stressed uh, Monday morning you should be able to see the first exam and uh, that's going to be open all the way to Friday by midnight so you have what I'm doing is I'm giving you a whole week to continue your studies uh, and then also to pick the best time for you the reason why I do this I used to have just one day for online classes and I found that uh, a lot of our students, because of their work schedules, you know, things are going on, and uh, so not everybody can take the exam. It seems to be at the same same time. So what I've done is I, I generally stretch my uh, exams over the whole week from Monday to Friday. So uh, Friday up to midnight. Of course, you don't want to take you don't want to take the exam uh, at near midnight. So. I mean, you, you're going to have, uh, uh, I'm going to be a little generous this first uh, exam. Now, some of the folks in the class, uh, some folks that they have uh, the my, their uh, accommodations, and I, I know who you are because those names are sent to me, uh, then you'll get your extra time, and I set that up for you. But... Uh, I'm gonna give everybody 75 minutes on this one, just to just because it's the first exam. I want to see how everybody does. Uh, so, uh, yeah, you want you want to take the exam well before midnight Friday. You don't want to be rushed. You, uh, you don't want to get, uh, you know, for example, you don't want to start at uh, 11 o'clock at night because you're gonna get cut short. So just remember that it ends at midnight sharp on uh, this coming Friday. Okay. Uh, another reason why I don't a lot of times uh, spout out dates on uh, these videos, I've, I've learned a lesson from years ago of doing my earlier 
courses, uh, early courses online and doing live videos is that uh, if it's a summer class and I had said that the exam would be a, would be on in June the fifteenth, then that confuses students because they're thinking, you know, uh, this is in the fall. So uh, I've learned my lesson not to spout out dates, but this if I was to teach this class again using this these videos. Now these are new videos with you guys. I'm just starting with this class. Though I've taught this class many times and online as well, but without the uh, video lectures. So I'm just doing these right now. But again, if I teach this again in the fall, it may be using it, these same videos again. So that's why I don't pay days. But uh, you know what? You know where we are. It's Sunday. Uh, class always begins. The new week starts on Monday, ends on Sundays by midnight. That what well, that basically entails for right now really is just to have your readings done for the week, read your chapters. If you got readings to do, you have done that, those, and that during that week, you have done and finished your uh, uh, your discussion questions by midnight that coming Sunday. And then on Monday morning, we start again. So it's week by week. If there's any changes in the schedule, I'll always uh, uh, let you know that there's going to be a change. Uh, and uh, so, just, just so you know, you know, we're based on a weekly schedule. My, my uh, classes are based on sort of uh, self-paced uh, modules. You're, you know, you, they're set up for the week. You pace it through the week because, again, I'm doing it as a flexibility. Uh, I know a lot of classes, uh, and I'm getting ready to take some uh, some new training on. Uh, canvas and uh, I know that it's going to probably get way more involved than what I uh, would like to use. I like having these courses open to a great extent in terms of time so that students are not having to be on every day so you don't have to be doing something with the online class every day, a new assignment every day. I'm not, I just don't do that. I don't think my philosophy, philosophy is that I don't think students learn enough. I think students learn more when they have less pressure to do, right? So you're having one chapter a week and then a set of discussion questions. And uh, it's kind of, so I call it a self-paced modules. You, you do your work during the week on your schedule because I know all of you have different lifestyles, different uh, timelines during the week. So I'll, I'll make that flexible for you. And so that's why that's a, that, I guess maybe the um, negative, everything has a positive and a negative. So I guess sometimes the negative might be that, uh, you know, you're especially for a lot, maybe other courses that you're more used to a more, uh, date, date based, uh, have this in on Tuesday, have this in by Thursday at such and such time. And I don't do that. And so you kind of have to get used to this sort of flexible open. Now, of course, if you have a question about any, anything upcoming, uh, certainly again, you can make time with me during my office hours. We can, t we can chat or we can talk by telephone. Uh, if you're, or if you just send me an email, you know, I like to clarify anything for you in terms of the expectations. For example, we are, you, you do have a uh, third textbook. Uh, it's called Nomads. It's about uh, uh, surviving the America in the 21st century. And it's called Nomads. Uh, and basically it's a ethnographic study and that's, uh, what I generally use, an ethnographic study. It's, it's not really a sociological um, per se. It's, it's written by a, uh, uh, a young lady who works uh, in one of the major newspapers. So it's more of a journalistic uh, ethnography, but an ethnography nonetheless. You know, all of the components besides theory. You know, she does talk a little bit about economic theory in there. But anyway, that's going to be an assignment that's going to be uh, coming up, uh, um, generally you get started around the, uh, the, during the break there, halfway, midterm. And then from there on, you should, uh, I'll have, what I'll have is, uh, 
you're going to write an essay paper, and I'm going to have a set of questions that I'll be giving you to uh, focus your your uh, your essay on. And uh, you'll read that book. That book you can get on Amazon. I think it may be a little cheaper on Amazon, actually. It's a popular, uh, popular book. Um, in fact, it's probably from what I've I've used it now for a couple of years, and uh, what I've heard from students in, in, is that they they found it to be the best text they've ever read while they were in university. They find it to be extremely interesting and easy to read, and they get a lot out of it. So it won't be a boring read for you. Uh, so uh, that'll be coming up about. Uh, right around midterm. So I'm not worried with that right now. You can go ahead and get the text, but if you don't have it right now, for whatever reason, you still got plenty of time to order it. And again, it may be cheaper for you to get it on Amazon. Uh, I think they probably even have used copies of it. Uh, it's not very expensive. I think it's, I think, don't quote me, I think it's around $21, $21 maybe uh, for, for the text. But uh, we'll be talking about that more. But that, that'll be an assignment that will uh, come midterm. It's not due until the end of the semester. So that you know, uh, again, you got all that time to work on it. And I'll be prodding you with it. I'll be talking to you about it, what you need to do uh, when the time comes. Um, I just wanted to say a, a little bit more about, uh, say some more about doing uh, uh, ethnographic research. And... Uh, um, I was going to show you uh, a textbook. Listen, I'm going to worry about that. Um, so uh, basically in looking at uh, qualitative methods, and as you notice there as you've studied, uh, there's one on uh, area on participant observation. Uh, another kind of term for it is field research ethnography and uh, when we talk about an ethnography is a descriptive analysis of a group or an organization it's a description of a people's culture for example it's describing what that culture is all about so in that sense then an ethnography is a a, a snapshot in, in in time of a particular culture or organization or a, a group of people. It's a portrait, if you will, uh, written within a specific time frame. And usually ethnographies can go from uh, just a few months to a year uh, to, to many years, multiple years of study. Um, and I, I really was a, have always been attracted to uh, Ethnography first for my interest in, in cultural anthropology, which I do. I teach that class as well. If you guys ever want to take another class with me, uh, uh, it's an intro uh, course. It's social 105. Uh, and uh, but I've always been interested in cultural anthropology. In my my dissertation research with the PD Indians in South Carolina, uh, a year long research um, that. Uh, that, uh, that research I did falls within the purview of cultural anthropology to some extent, though I was asking more sociological questions, if you will. So I see it as an uh, anthropological sociology, sort of, so to speak, a kind of a hybrid, if you will. Uh, <clears throat> so that kind of um, made me, and also focusing on Native Americans, uh, made, it, made it pertinent for me to be teaching our her uh, cultural anthropology course, which I really enjoy, uh, but also in in in, uh, in social sociological social psychology, it's uh, especially with uh, especially with the interactionist uh, tradition. Uh, the ethnography is quite centered, one of the center uh, 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 methodologies that are utilized. Uh, of course, there's other forms of qualitative research uh, as you read here 
and uh, certain types of uh, uh, ways or methods of doing a participant observation. So I, I'll just start with just uh, making a distinction between ethnography and ethnology. Ethnology is different from eth, and you don't have that concept, by the way, in the chapter, but uh, there, there are these two concepts. Sometimes even academics get them confused. Uh, and and ethnology, ethnology is the study of, of it's taking many different ethnographies. Each, each is a each is a description of a culture, and then looking over all of those ethnographic studies, and then maybe trying to generalize to this to human to the human condition in some way. It's kind of it's kind of like a, a, a qualitative answer to what people do in the quantitative in making their work generalizable to you using probability statistics. Uh, but for us, uh, though, uh, ethnographers uh, and qualitative sociologists do use uh, quantitative methods. Uh, what we see in the chapter here, it talks about mixed methods, using a little bit of both. Not all studies do. Uh, but uh, one way in which one of the one of the uh, negatives, so to speak, of doing participant observation ethnographic style research is it's very good at looking at that particular one case study, for example, and exploring it at depth. Uh, but it's not it's not uh, it's not it's not really great at, at being able to generalize from that study. So I can say, well, I, I did an ethnographic study of the PD tribe of South Carolina. Uh, some of my some of my findings may reflect upon other local uh, native groups, for example, in the in the state or in say between the PD and the Lumbee, there may be some similarities that we could talk about, some generalizations. But you certainly couldn't generalize it all to the whole to all tribes in the United States. Uh, that, that you can't, you know, you may talk about their relationships, but you can't really generalize and say what I found here among the PD is something that I can generalize to the Apache, right, or the Lakota. That's that's not not going to happen. Uh, so on the one hand, it's very good for coming to understand the life ways of people up close in a particular community organization or group. Uh, but it's not good in generalizing. Now, what ethnology does is say, okay, if I want to enter, if I want to, uh, the reason why I'm doing that is I have a gnat flying around. Uh, one thing you can do is uh, through ethnology can help make types of studies a little more generalizable. Instead of focusing on one ethnography, let's say, uh, let's say gang studies study of gangs. Uh, instead of just looking at one particular gang, you can, uh, there are these big databases, especially at, for example, at the U of M, the University of Michigan has one, where all of this data is put into these computer programs, files, and you can use this data, data set to make comparative contrast and comparisons across studies. So all the studies of gang, the literature on gang ethnographic studies that have been done in the United States, uh, all that data can be put in into that system. And then a, a, a researcher then can retrieve those uh, studies and search for, for commonalities across, as well as differences between those various studies. And by doing that, then then one may be able to, for example, make generalizations about the nature of certain types of gangs in the United States overall. And also to stress maybe uh, the differences between them in terms of uh, what uh, context they're in, social context they're happening and taking place, you know, certain cities, uh, certain uh, states, for example. So in that sense, we can broaden out the picture. That's just one way of doing so. Uh, but ethnography is the snapshot description of just one culture 
one group of uh, one organiz organization or group of uh, people or community for example uh, and the, the major technique that's utilized in research technique utilized in, in the, doing an ethnographic study is participant observation. Uh, now you can have just observation without participating. So you might be on the outside of a group, let's say you're studying a gang but uh, you're doing so by sitting in a, uh, you, you, you know a certain block where there's a lot of gang activity going on on the street, but you're just sitting across the street in a, in a, in a park, and you're just observing, making observations during the day. You're not interacting with them. That would be considered observation. Um, even in, a, in even a, a study like the, uh, up close like I've done with uh, various groups, um, even though I'm using participant observation, it's not always it's not always participating. Sometimes it can be just being around at some place and and you're listening to other people talk or, or observing some interactions that's going on in the moment and uh, listening and, and observing what's happening. And uh, then you can glean information, data. You, know, you can glean data from that. Uh, but participant observation is when you, as a researcher, you, the philosophy, the philosophy, the underlying philosophy of participant observation is that through participating with the people you're studying, it gives you and sort of an insider sense or feeling of what it's like to be a member of this group and doing what we're doing, right? But if you're interested, and I'm not trying to be lighthearted, I mean, uh, well, I was, as I mentioned before, study of microcultures. Uh, um, even with microcultures, uh, like uh, skateboarding, you know, kids in these little um, microcultures that uh, they have their gang of uh, skateboarding group you know and uh, so you may in order to get in good with that group to find out what it's like to be a skate skateboarder uh, in, uh, in terms of participant observation you may want to learn how to sk uh, skateboard before you enter into the field and uh, maybe take part in some of their events when they're skating as you're skating along with them uh, or they're having some kind of competition and you're Maybe you're skilled enough to be able to, you know, do that, you know, yeah, or skiing or, or, or uh, whether it's uh, snow skiing or water skiing, you can do a study. If you, if you have those, that skill, then you could take part, you know. Um, when I was studying with the, uh, um, the PD tribe, I participated in a lot of different events and, uh, so that, um, uh, uh, for example, around Christmas, I would take part in uh, the Christmas uh, giving out gifts to the people in the rural community. And uh, so I, I took part in uh, helping them prepare their um, their gifts, their boxes, you know, with certain food stuff and some gifts for the kids. Uh, they would di dis distribute deer meat uh, after hunting during the fall season. And uh, we would... Uh, not before right before Christmas, we loaded up the trucks and went out into the and went out into the communities, out into the rural areas where people are very isolated, members of the tribe. And in that respect, then that, that participant observation, I was there to hand out. Well, usually I was with the chief, and we would go together, and uh, we were handing out uh, the goods, and uh, one one. Plus, for my research is while I was doing that, I'm, I'm using what you'll read in this chapter about the different, uh, you know, uh, ways of interviewing, and but I would use the snowball, the snowball technique of interviewing, where you, uh, you know, instead of using a random sample, I just use uh, the word of mouth of who to speak to next. So when I was out doing uh, the Christmas uh, participation with the Christmas uh, gifts. 
I was able to meet new people of the tribe who were in these rural areas that I would probably never find them. And, uh, and while there talking with them, I'd ask them if it'd be okay if I came back again and then sit down and have a open-ended interview. And so that made it possible for me to come in and, uh, and do my further research and then the further snowballing. Once I interviewed them, find out there's some other folks that they suggest I go speak to. And it worked that way through for over a year. Uh, but also participated in other events as well. Uh, you know, also a part of my research with the PD was autoethnographic in the sense that uh, I was a, both an insider and outsider of the culture because I was raised in the same community and went to school with a lot of the uh, board members of the tribe. So we were friends uh, from an early age on, but I was an outsider in terms of uh, coming back in. I was in uh, Toronto at the time, coming back in and finding that, uh, you know, they're, now they're actually a, a, a Native American tribe and they had their various roles of chief and your secretaries. You got your other members of the board. So I was an outsider to that organization and also sort of an outsider in terms of their Native Americanness because when I was a kid growing up with the, uh, the uh, PD uh, uh, friends of mine, uh, they didn't talk about being in Native American or Indian at that time. And uh, so years later, when I was in grad school, they had been coming together to reestablish their tribe. And so they were more open about it at, at this point. And uh, so that's where I came in. And uh, but it was auto ethnographic in that uh, I was just a researcher with researching uh, along with my what I call my key consultants, the chief and board members and some other members. Uh, uh, that, that helped me, and I, as I was doing my research, they were doing the same. So, what, for example, the chief and I, we would go down to Columbia, South Carolina, to the archives to look for some archives on the PD tribe. We were both working together uh, in trying to interpret data. Uh, what does this mean? You know, we, we, we went to this event, or I interviewed these people. I would want to sit down with board members or the chief and ask them what what does this mean i want to make sure i'm giving a reading into this data set so i want to know what your perspective is on it i don't want to make a mistake and just give my perspective i want to hear what you have to say so in that sense it was very uh auto -ethno ethnographic auto means like an autobiography as well so when I start my research on working in with the uh, my study coming up of, of the uh, songwriters in Nashville subculture, that's going to be very autoethnographic because I, I spent a number of years in that subculture. So um, I'm going to be able to write myself into the study. I'll be one of the I will be one of the subjects in the study, and I can tell some of the things that I knew and experienced. Uh, while I was there. And then from that, I can talk about what has changed, what is still similar, because uh, it's been a good n good number of years, uh, 30 years, I guess. I hate to say it's been that long ago, but and the city has changed. Think about back that during that time, we didn't have the internet. We didn't have all the social media. So everything was more just hands-on. And uh, that whole industry, like it, most everything else, has it's changed since then. And uh, so my thing is to find out what has changed about it. the role of the songwriting subculture uh, in relationship to the uh, formal uh, business side, the record companies and, and publishers, production of, uh, uh, on that side of the more formal business side of, uh, of the music industry. Uh, the auto, auto ethnography. Uh, we, we, in our research, uh, as uh, quality researchers, we we can do different types of interviewing. So one type is they they talk in here about the in-depth interview, it's sort of a it can be sort of semi-structured. 
you never may have some questions you want to ask, but you keep them, uh, you know, you don't have a clipboard, so to speak. You just sort of keep them in frame so that you can touch base with these as you're going through your in-depth conversation, allowing the interviewees to really open up and talk about things in depth. And uh, there's a skill to it. Uh, uh, sometimes when you're training, which I have gone through, ethnographic training, uh, not just academically, but also in working uh, in Robinson County, uh, uh, a governmental a governmental uh, program we had uh, where we were uh, doing policy. I would call it policy ethnography, where we, and another term for it would be applied, applied ethnographic research, where we were trying to uh, investigate the uh, 35 most poorest areas in the United States. And uh, uh, unfortunately, uh, Robson County was one of the, actually it was the only county that we researched for the, you know, so we were being paid by the federal government uh, to myself and a partner uh, at UNCP to uh, do the ethnographic research necessary to implement this, what was called the Youth Opportunity Grant. And that was, that entails setting up a storefront uh, uh, places where the youth could come in, maybe have some pool tables and games, uh, a place where they could come and talk with uh, uh, some of the uh, folks that worked there, helping them to find jobs. So it was going to also entail training and doing things like uh, putting your, uh, you know, uh, put, putting together a, a job application, this kind of thing, and uh, and then helping them to find work. So it was all about unemployed youth in very poor areas. Uh, the other 34 areas were all uh, highly urbanized, uh, 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 basically based on neighborhoods and streets within big cities like Chicago, Washington, D.C., and others. Mine was the only rural county. In a big one, you know, so it's such a large county. So it was it was interesting to, to all the other uh, all the other uh, ethnographers that were there in training uh, to hear about uh, Robinson County. They, they found it very intriguing in uh, the size of the county. It's one it's the largest county in in, in North Carolina, and uh, so uh, we were trained to do an interviewing and. Uh, we had to play it out, you know, we had to practice it with each other in doing our interviewing skills. An in-depth interview is very open-ended. You're really looking to find some very broad information, if you will, and in-depth. Uh, um, but then there's other types too. You can do uh, another way is, is and all this has to do with formality. Then you can have some very informal informal types of uh, interviewing, almost uh, conversational, I call it conversational interviewing. And I would say about 98% of my study with the PD was conversational, mainly just talking to each other. And then in the afternoons every day, the ethnographer goes home and uh, the rule of thumb is to, to write down the notes of the day. So I would reconstruct what I what was said, what I said to others, what I heard, events that happened that day. I'd put that into my files in my daily notes. That became my da data set. And uh, at the end of a year, my study was going to be as good as the notes I had taken because my my notes was my data. It was not quantified. It wasn't uh, the statistical study I did. That I had. Uh, derived from a uh, structured questionnaire. It all came from my participant observation, my open-ended uh, interviewing and conversations that I had. And uh, that was about 98% of, of the methodology I used for the entire study and, and every day doing my notes. Usually an ethnographer keeps two, two ongoing files. It used to be done by hand, but now I'm you know, because of our computers, it's much easier. And so you keep two, two different files. One is your data file. And in that data file, you generally don't uh, bring in a lot of personal 
things like you don't bring in how you're feeling that day, your emotions and whatnot. Uh, it's just to it's just to um, describe what was important that day, what was said. Uh, that helps to stuff that you can remember, and, you, and you, you'll be surprised how well you can remember when you're doing an ethnography in this this fashion. But the rule of thumb is 24 hours. And uh, so you have two files ongoing. So one is that analytical file. Then the other file is more of a personal diary. Second, so in that one, I can uh, I can describe my grievance, my grievances, my emotions, the emotions of other people I'm studying with. You know, all the day the chief was upset because we didn't find much in the in the in the, in the state archives. And I've, I also felt sort of down that things weren't going as well. We've come to a stalemate in our research. So these emotions, how we feel about other people, you know, whether it's uh, very positive or very negative relationships. And in general, when you're doing a ethnographic field research, uh, you're going to, some people are going to like you and some people are not. And uh, you've got to be good at, uh, you got to be good at treading water and trying to get along with people as best you can uh, so that you don't uh, get into any real hot water with the uh, leaders, especially your key, key consultants. Uh, you want to keep things as neutral as possible. Sometimes it's hard to do, so you can vent in your diary, right? Uh, so uh, there's going to be other uh, examples I'll be giving you about ethnographic research if you go. And uh, qualitative methods, again, are very good at looking at, uh, not looking at, at social life in a black and white manner. It's not either yes or no, like you do on a questionnaire. It's yes, no, sometimes. And in between all those answers, there can be some very gray areas. You know, you know, as you know, everyday life is kind of a sloppy thing. It's a complex, uh, sometimes a very fluid and contradictory. People can be very contradictory in their behaviors. You know, one day they say this, the next day they're doing something. What we call uh, one of our rules of thumb, you don't have it in this chapter, but uh, the difference between ideal culture and real culture. And for, an, uh, for a uh, smart ethnographer, one thing you do is keep that in mind is that Groups are going to want to tell you what's their ideal culture. Oh, we're going to, you know, we're so uh, united. There's so much, uh, uh, there's so much, uh, love among our members. And, you know, we treat each other just like family. And so that's word of mouth. That, that's what people say they do. That's the ideal culture. You're going to get that. You're going to have to contrast that with the real culture. The real culture is what you observe them doing. So on one hand, it's what they say to do, and on the other, uh, the other is uh, what they actually do. And as we know, uh, that can be ourselves as well. Uh, we know that, that uh, what we say we're going to do and what we really do might be two different things. That's very important for a, an ethnographer is to get at that real culture. Uh, so that way you won't write up a, a report that's uh, really praising uh, a, a people's way of life without, you know, and it may be false. It's not giving a false impression because a lot of times there are conflicts in, in communities. And uh, so sometimes you have to, sometimes you have to bring these to the fore. And uh, you can do that through qualitative methods. You can get into all those gray areas of life uh, where people are contradictory, right? kind of contradictions and uh, so you can record this you can't really hard do that with quantitative style research but they both have their strengths and their weaknesses as you read again I'm going to test you just over the qualitative this time around so uh, letting you know that and, uh, and as we go into uh, we move into these more substantive chapters after this, uh, as we move in further, 
I'll be bringing in more examples of research I've done, methods I've used to, to go along with and highlight uh, what we'll be talking about in upcoming chapters as we go. And uh, so for now, uh, since I'm 40 minutes in, it's going to take a while to download this uh, video. So uh, yeah, just re just uh, remember your exams coming up this week as uh, as well. You have uh, chapter four is also this week, but I'm not going to give you a bunch of readings for chapter four uh, because you're studying for your exam. So you mainly this week is to read chapter four, and uh, I'll do the uh, video lectures. Uh, you'll have the study materials, and go ahead and study for your first exam. And you have again from Monday through Friday at midnight to complete the, that first exam, and. Uh, so, and you'll have 75 minutes. And uh, I'll put up some more notes on the announcements. Keep your eyes both on your emails and announcements for things coming. And uh, I'll have some more there. Uh, and uh, I'll also, at the same time, I'll be catching up on some of the some of your uh, uh, these early uh, uh, discussion questions, and I'll be looking over those this coming week. And again, I don't grade those until the end of the semester, uh, but uh, I do begin to take in my notes about who's coming on there and who's not. And uh, if you really want to get most of your participation points, make sure you you do all of them. Well, you do all of them. Uh, if, if you're missing one or two, uh, that's not going to take anything off your points. But if you're missing half of them, that's going to hurt you pretty bad. But uh, if you're doing none, that's really bad. Uh, but uh, I'm expecting you to do the majority. Uh, so if you're if you're doing 100%, uh, then that's going to really get you most of those. Things. And you're doing reasonable writing. Uh, I, I, you know, since you're answering similar questions, I can tell when somebody's plagiarizing another student if you're using the very same words they're using. And so don't be doing that. And uh, and also I have other ways of figuring that out, little secrets that we keep, but uh, anyway, so I'll let you guys go, and I'll talk to you sometime here during the week, I'll have uh, either one or two uh, more lecture videos to to come, it's coming with chapter four, all right, everybody, and stay well, and uh, I'll talk to you soon.